So welcome, everybody. This is a session to make sure you're in the right place. Uh, this session is titled Building a Support Network for Implementation of the UNESCO OER Recommendation. Uh, my colleagues and I will all introduce ourselves in just a moment, but to make sure we're all in the right place, I just dropped a link into the chat. And this will be our, this is our main uh, session space where we'll link out to various documents and we will take notes as well. I wanna emphasize that uh, all of us, uh, including the participants, have write access or edit access to all of these documents. And so we are gonna be asking you to, uh, to write on these documents. Uh, if you have resources to share, et cetera, please add them all because this will be part of the archive of the session. And we will uh, share this out along with the recording. So uh, first of all, welcome uh, everybody. Uh, we're gonna do just a quick round of introductions in the chat. And so if everybody would uh, go over to the chat, which is on the right side of your screen, and if you could type in your name, uh, where you're from, what uh, city and country you're in today, uh, where you work or what kind of work that you do. Uh, and then maybe just if you have anything you'd like to say about your interest in the UNESCO recommendation on OER, you could add that too. So name, where you are, what you do, and your interest <laughs> in the recommendation. Oh man, there's the whole hour right there. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not, we have a lot more to do. <laughs> yeah, it's teasing. <laughs> It's great to see everybody here. Um, yeah. So, Should we introduce ourselves? Well, okay. or... Yeah, yeah. Why don't you go first, Jenren? Go for it. Um, okay, sure. So I I know many of you in the in the audience here, but my name is Jenren Wetzler, and I am the assistant director of Open Education at Creative Commons, and I have the pleasure of working with Cable. Um, directly, and then also with Paul and Igor and many of you on some of our different open education projects. Um, particularly, I, I get to focus on our CC certificate program, which is a training program in open licensing. So thank you all for joining us. Igor, you want to go next? Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're connecting from. Thank you for joining this session. Uh, my name is Igor Lesko. I come from Slovakia, but I've been based in South Africa for the past what, 20 years now. And I work for the Open Education Global together with Paul uh, as Director of Operations. Thanks, Igor. You just introduced me. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Stacey. I'm based in Vancouver, Canada. I'm the Executive Director for Open Education Global and, um, and also a former friend and colleague and employee of Creative Commons. And it's wonderful to see some uh, many faces and friends or names at least of people that I remember fondly from my Creative Commons years and also um, new people that I've met since then. Fantastic, thanks for being here. And hi everybody, my name is Cable Green. I'm the Director of Open Education at Creative Commons and welcome. All right, back to this uh, main document, which I'll share again for those people who came in after we shared it last time. Uh, we're gonna go just very quickly through some logistics here. We've uh, You're on the main doc. You'll also see that there are Google Docs for each one of the four topics that we'll be covering. We'll talk uh, more about that in just a minute. So if you get lost, you can come back to this document uh, and also on the SCED for the schedule uh, for the, for the uh, session for this event. Uh, we've also got, we're linked to this main document. So we've tried to, Make sure that if you get kicked out of your browser or lose your internet connection, it's easy to find your way back. All right, we're gonna move down to, uh, to the summary here and then uh, we'll dive right into it. First, uh, a summary of the UNESCO recommendation on OER. If you haven't read this document yet, highly recommend that you do so uh, after this session. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a document that has a, a long history. So it goes really all the way back to 2002 uh, when UNESCO actually coined the term open educational resources. Uh, fast forward 10 years, a lot of work happened around the world. Uh, UNESCO held a meeting of its uh, member states and out of that came something called the uh, UNESCO Declaration on OER in 2012. Five years after that, there was a, uh, an OER Global Congress in Slovenia 
where the world's governments or 40 or so of them came together and talked about progress that had been made since the declaration was passed. And then two years later, uh, in November of 2019, uh, UNESCO adopted what's called the UNESCO recommendation on OER. Now, the good news is this was a, uh, it was a unanimous consensus vote. Uh, so what that means is that all of UNESCO's member states uh, voted yes to adopt this uh, formal UNESCO instrument. So, uh, so why does this matter? Well, it matters because uh, this is a document that was co-created not only by UNESCO staff, but by NGOs, by stakeholders around the world, by uh, governments, by the member states of UNESCO to create a, a document, or it's, a, it's actually a recommendation, which is full of different actions, which we're going to be talking through today, um, of actions that, that national governments can take. And within, that, within a national, uh, within a country, state governments, provincial governments, and institutions can take guidance from these as well. But the primary audience here is national governments. What can they do to implement open education in their countries? And the, the document is comprehensive. It covers many different areas of open education, uh, which we'll, we'll talk through today. And so really what today's uh, discussion is about, and then I'm gonna turn it over to, to Paul to get into some detail here, but we're gonna talk about what is it that we, as members of the open education community, can do to help these national governments implement this new UNESCO recommendation on OER. Paul, over to you. Thanks, Cable. Um, so when this all started to unfold in, in 2019, it seemed like a really pivotal moment in time for open education to have 193 member state countries essentially say yes to OER recommendation feels like a pretty big opportunity. And so um, one of the things that I began to think about was how might we as the open education community and organizations that are involved in open education kind of come together and form a bit of a coalition or a, a network of sister organizations to join forces and help governments with this implementation of the OER recommendation. All of us have been doing kind of independent, sometimes autonomous work, but this felt like a, um, a moment in time when we really needed to coalesce and create capacity for us to collect on something this OER recommendation. So, um, so starting at the end of last year and, and continuing even now, we've been uh, organizing monthly meetings of organizations that are doing open education work around the world to try to uh, coordinate how we would present ourselves and offer support to governments seeking to implement the OER recommendation. Um, it's been fascinating actually to, to do this. It's as you probably have experienced yourself sometimes when you try to uh, collaborate with others in, in a, 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 a congenial consensual sort of fashion, it can be challenging to kind of reach the, the agreement about what we should do, but it's really been fantastic to, to kind of have these opportunities to come together and talk specifically about the OER recommendation. I should also say that it's meant to complement UNESCO's own efforts uh, around creating a dynamic amongst the member states to also look at how to support and engage governments with the OER recommendation. So that's sort of the, the origin of this, what we now call the network of open orgs. Uh, so for example, um, the network includes Open Education Global, where Igor and I work, but it also includes Creative Commons, where Genren and Cable are, Commonwealth of Learning, the International Council for Open and Distance Education, ISKME, um, the Hewlett Foundation, the Wikimedia Foundation, and others. And so there's an interesting collective of organizations that are all working together on this uh, opportunity. I'll call it an opportunity because I think that's really what it is. Uh, for today, what we wanted to do was engage all of you in talking about the opportunity. And uh, as Cable has uh, stated, each of the uh, four action areas within the UNESCO OER recommendation have been um, broken out into separate Google Docs, um, topics one through four on the big uh, document that Cable has shared with you. And we're going to go through each of the four action areas and invite you to 
um, identify existing resources, projects, and initiatives that could help with the implementation of that action area. And also, if you know of organizations that are in your part of the world that you think could assist with implementation, we're very eager to hear about those too. We'll have uh, each of these uh, four action areas will be facilitated by one of us, and uh, we'll do them one at a time and kind of go through the whole process. Um, I think that's really, I'll, I think I'll stop there, Cable. So um, back to topic one, which is cable, building capacity of stakeholders to create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER. Great, thanks, Paul. So um, as, as uh, Paul mentioned, what we're going to do is uh, we're gonna, e each of us will introduce one of these topics. These are kind of the four main areas of action in the recommendation. We're gonna do that back to back to kind of give you a sense of the entire thing. Uh, and then we're going to, we're all gonna uh, work for a minute. We're gonna work on these documents, add resources, uh, and then kind of move into discussion. So uh, when we move into discussion, you can uh, contribute by, or you can raise your hand in the chat, or you can put something in. We also have the opportunity to bring you up on stage where you can have audio and video as well. Um, so that's kind of the sequence here. Um, I'll go ahead and kick it off. We're gonna start with topic number one. And on the agenda, you'll see a link to, uh, to a Google Doc, uh, which I'm going to uh, highlight right here and make a, I don't know, I'm gonna highlight it in purple so that you can see it on the, the agenda. And I'm also going to drop the link into the chat of this session. So here is topic number one. We're all staying together in this main room. There are no breakout rooms. So if you look over at topic number one, uh, what we're going to do, if you scroll down a little bit, and you see these bolded sections, which I'll highlight, uh, the three areas where we want to really think through, and this goes for all the topics, is the specific help that uh, you or your government needs with implementing this new instrument, this recommendation on OER from UNESCO. The second category is existing resources, projects, and initiatives that could help with the implementation of the recommendation. And the third category are orgs uh, that are global, regional, or local that could assist with the recommendation. And we've also, you see these subcategories here, getting started, ramping up, or full scale. Um, if you've got a sense of where your national government is in its thinking about adoption of open education, it might be helpful to put these resources under the right area. So for example, if your government is brand new to open education, they haven't really talked about it, there isn't a lot happening in your country with open education initiatives, then you might think about put adding resources to the, to the getting started area for countries that are in that situation. If you know of resources that are really for, uh, for governments that are ramping up, so this might be that there have been some open education projects around the country, mostly at a grassroots level, but there's uh, there's a growing interest and maybe some policy discussions about how to provide more funding or more political support around open education. If you've got resources that are that might fit that, ramping up might, would be a good place to put it. And then the last one, full scale. If you're in a uh, if you have resources that you think are really designed for countries that are have made a, a dedicated effort and are going, quote, all in on open education, meaning they're really going to try to make open education the default in their country. They're interested in taking all of the actions in this UNESCO recommendation and implementing a lot of them. If you've got a resource that might fit in that category, that's what, the, that's, what that's for. Um, if you're not sure where the resource goes, just go ahead and add it. We'll sort it out later. So if you scroll down to the bottom of the page of topic one, what we've done for all four of these topic, topics is copy and paste from the recommendation itself the, the detail about each of these topics. So this topic is about building capacity to create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER. What I've done here is I've highlighted the key concepts that the recommendation talks about. So if you scroll down and you look at A, so I'm highlighting A here, it's really about building awareness. So we all know that if people don't know about open education, if they don't, haven't really thought about, you know, the copyright status or whether or not the work's openly licensed or in the public domain, if they haven't had a discussion or be made aware about the value of open education, 
um, then it's really difficult to engage people about uh, why this would be important work. And so uh, building awareness is obviously a critical thing to do. Uh, lots of examples around the world on how to do that. Everything from uh, having a countrywide uh, conference to having state or regional or provincial conferences, and sometimes at institutions of education themselves. The next category under B is about providing uh, systematic and continuous capacity building. And the idea here is really to weave OER and open education practices and open policy into existing training programs. So they mentioned here in-service and pre-service training. Um, the idea is, is that if there are uh, if there are existing things like schools of education at universities, if there are teacher training programs, if there are existing professional development opportunities, uh, to think about integrating open education into those opportunities so that we're actually building capacity in country. This really involves, get, gets at uh, skilling up and uh, increasing the expertise um, of individuals who can help work on the recommendation. If you go down to C, um, this is really about um, exceptions and limitations and raising the awareness about those for using copyrighted works in addition to open educational resources. So we all know that if for something to be an open educational resource, you must have the legal permissions to be able to, to, to use it, modify it, change it, share it with other people. Um, you, while you can't do that with works that are all rights deserve copyright, some countries, not all, but some countries have what are called exceptions and limitations to copyright, uh, especially for education and research purposes. Sometimes those are called fair dealing rights. Sometimes those are called fair use rights, and they have other terms. But the idea here is that you can use uh, all rights reserved copyrighted resources without permission. Sometimes Some governments, not all, provide some of those uh, exceptions and limitations. So this is about raising awareness about those. D uh, basically says, let's leverage the existing openly licensed tools, the platforms or delivery mechanisms, uh, metadata, standards, uh, et cetera, that are already in place or that are in use in other countries around the world uh, to make sure that the edu openly licensed education resources can be found and accessed and adapted, et cetera. Um, so part of the point here is we don't need to, in many cases, recreate the wheel. Uh, for example, we already have open licensing. Everybody doesn't have to create their own open licenses. Um, we already have, uh, there's some really good examples of using metadata to mark up content. There are a lot of OER repositories around the world that can be leveraged if you don't have the the resources to create one of your own in your country. E is about uh, making these resources uh, easy, accessible and easily available um, and understanding how to do that. So this is everything from, uh, from openly licensing the resources, making sure that they're technically accessible. So when, we, when we're thinking about accessibility, making sure everybody, regardless of if they can see or hear or whatever uh, their accessibility need might be to make sure that they're in the proper formats. Uh, with OER, we often think about providing uh, the resources in editable file formats and wherever possible in multiple and especially open file formats. And so uh, really thinking about accessibility to the works. And the last one here is uh, promoting digital literacy skills. So if, um, while OER can certainly be offline and it can be analog, for the most part, uh, the content that we deal with in education today is digital, or at least it has a digital back end. And in order to, in many cases, access those resources and certainly to manipulate those resources and edit them and modify them, translate them into different languages, uh, create copies that are for local audiences and really make sure that the learners' voices are in them requires that you've got the ability to produce these, modify them, and share them on. So they, all the digital literacy skills that one needs um, are critical for that task. So that's the very, uh, very brief summary of topic number one. Uh, let me pass it on to, uh, to Igor, who's gonna talk about topic number two. 
Thank you very much, Cable. Um, it's also good to see that some participants have already started adding resources or more information on that, this specific topic, uh, Cable, that you have explained really well. Uh, thank you, Hans. And I think there is also a question from one of the participants whether the recommendation itself has been discussed at the level of, what I believe, is African Union. So if anybody here knows that, uh, please post a comment. Uh, as Paul already mentioned earlier on, all 193 member states uh, adopted the recommendation, which means, which also includes obviously governments from Africa. So, but whether or not that has been discussed at the level of AU, I'm not personally so sure about. Okay, uh, so now the second topic. Um, thank you, Janine, for the link. Um, so the lack of uh, the lack of enabling policies and strategies, either at, either at governmental or institutional levels, has been identified by numerous practitioners and organizations, um, and, and and policymakers around the world as one of the major impediments uh, to to mainstreaming OER and related practices. And so this second area of recommendation uh, is directly linked to this dilemma. Uh, it calls on governments and institutions to create a more supportive environment for OER and the related practices through the adoption uh, and implementation of applicable policies either at, either at institutional or governmental levels. Now there are eight specific uh, areas of recommendation, a recommendation under this area, which is developing a supportive policy. I'm not going to go through all of them in much detail. Hopefully you had a chance to go through those uh, before the session, uh, but also alternatively you can find uh, the entire text uh, in that Google Doc uh, on the topic two that Janine has just shared. Thank you, Janine. Uh, just to highlight a few, uh, just to sum it up very briefly, the possible actions here uh, might include rules or regulations requiring that all educational resources developed through public funds be released openly, that OER is embedded uh, within national education strategies or strategies uh, aimed at transforming education, or that OER is aligned, aligned within existing open access, open science, open data policies, and others. Uh, this area of the recommendation also calls on the creation of communities of practices, networks of experts, and OER-related capacity building activities, uh, especially in the context of teacher professional development. And last but not least, this area also calls on more research um, into OER, uh, which also supports evidence-based policy making. Um, so that's in a nutshell about this area of the recommendation. It follows the same methodology that uh, Cable has outlined for topic number one. So there are three broad areas uh, questions. So please feel free to contribute your inputs directly into the document. And now over to you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I will post the, um, the third topic here in the chat. Um, so this topic is um, encouraging effective, inclusive, and equitable access to quality OER. Um, the topic relates to how we can support the use, creation, adaptation, and sharing of OER for all stakeholders. So making access and engagement with OER as inclusive as possible. So as we're thinking about populating these different areas, um, it's probably most important to think about the different contexts that can be at play that we may we, we may not normally consider when when working with resources. So those contexts may be formal and informal learning contexts, online and offline communities, gender, age, and socioeconomic sensitivities, cultural and and um, contextual sensitivities such as if the learners are affected by a natural disaster or are in the middle of a conflict or fleeing from a conflict, um, the relevant language for learners and the interrelation between these different um, vulnerabilities. So as we start to populate these different areas, just consider those contexts and how we might best address those contexts to make um, things as inclusive and equitable in, um, for everyone. Topic three also relates to our public and private investments and in infrastructure to enable increased access um, and the development, um, research, and regular quality assurance mechanisms that we can put in place. So it covers a lot of different areas. I will stop there, but feel free to scroll down and read through some of the, um, the more detailed information about uh, this, this area. All right, over to Paul. Thanks, Adrian. So I'll do this fourth topic, and then what I suggest is that uh, all of us 
uh, the four of us stop for a bit and ask if there are questions or comments or suggestions and give people some thinking time as well to put things into the document. But the fourth, the fourth um, action area of the recommendation deals with sustainability models for open education resources. And I would say of the five topics within the recommendation, this one is perhaps the least developed. Uh, most of what's been happening in open education so far has largely sort of started at the grassroots level and has kind of bubbled up from there. And um, and now with the recommendation, what we're seeing is an opportunity for there to be some uh, top level support, let's say, in terms of government providing some support for open education adoption within their country or region. So the sustainability sections um, talk about whether there's a need to review the processes involved with provisioning education. So uh, the way that we acquire the resources that are used by educators within education might need to be changed to support open education. It also talks about um, looking at using existing funds that um, governments have for education differently. So. It isn't always about adding more money. It, it can be about using existing funds in a different fashion. And I think this is actually really a critical component of this sustainability recommendation. It also um, explores whether there are some alternative funding approaches that could be used. We know that open education isn't just about providing funding for creation of open education and infrastructure, um, but, but we also know that the whole community generates value through its open education resource use by making enhancements, by making revisions, by iterating the resources. And how do we account for that co-creation of value across the whole ecosystem? I think this is something governments need to consider and, and, and uh, incentivize by including some opportunities to do that kind of thing within uh, within the ways in which business is done. And so those are a few snippets from the sustainability section. There's there's a you know as with the other documents, there's an extensive description of what sustainability uh, is intended to address at the end of that Google document. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and I, I I will say that I think. Um, this particular topic is also a critical one for governments as particularly now when we're in the COVID where where there's a kind of an experience of an economic crunch and um and so uh, i think positioning open education as um not necessarily a cost increase but actually as a means of saving money or reutilizing money in more effective ways is uh, is a preferable message, but I'll stop there. Um, and I, I know there's been some great questions asked. So um, why don't we first talk about Werner's question? It's kind of dealing with policies, Igor. So maybe you want to make a first stab at that. Well, uh, thank you, Paul. I think that actually Kevo was proposing to bring Werner on the stage to articulate this. Oh, idea. sure, great. Right. Awesome. Come on up. <laughs> so, so Werner, you have to, in the upper right corner, it says something like audio and video, or if you click on that red button, we can let you join us up here and then we, everybody can listen. Oh, there you are. So I'm adding you now. And here you come, we think. Come on up to the stage, Werner. See, I added him, but I don't see him yet. If it's not working, try it again, Werner. Try clicking on that one. <laughs> and oh, there he is. There. Buenos dias. <laughs> hey, guys. How are you doing? You hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The hair needs a little fixing there, I think. <laughs> I'm following your trend, Paul. My hearing message, you know. Um, the UNESCO recommendations is just a great milestone uh, achieved uh, through a, a long, very long process. 
and uh, and here it is. We have a, a and um, but I think one of the key issues is how are we as a community uh, who's trying to collectively approach uh, the the implementation of this recommendation? How can we spark the demand for OER policies in in the different aspects that uh, and. And I ask it because I, I've been very unsuccessful trying to push these things in my country, and um, and, and you feel a lot of reluctance. There's a lot of politics involved in that, but I, I think we need to have more than just um, a set of principles and, and visions around this issue. Is how can how can we collectively kind of move up so we can spark that demand for for not only for policies, but for any type of uh, initiative that can come from central governments. Because I think that's another key issue. This recommendation is really based on national governments. So if we want to promote, for example, policies, we need to have that national scope. In that sense, where's how do we spark that demand? It's, it's something that I haven't figured out. So hopefully you guys uh, have good answers for that. Thank you. <laughs> Igor, you want to kick us off? <clears throat> well, there is not a simple answer to this, I think, Werner, but the one uh, thing that I can say based on some of the experience, uh, things that I've also observed um, as far as policy developments in different countries are concerned, is that lots of those policy advancements in different countries are can be attributed to the work of sort of individual champions or national coalitions of sorts. So it, it, it is these structures or those individuals that, that are actually pushing for policy changes in respective countries. So it's 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 not that the countries themselves are coming forward saying like, you know, we want to, to make this policy happen, uh, help us. Often it's through the work of those individual champions or the networks. But so that in, in my in my view, at least that requires some really um, targeted and nuanced advocacy. Um, it's not like sort of one approach fits all. Um, you, it really needs to be tailored to the sort of specific opportunities and challenges uh, within specific countries and then tailoring your advocacy messages accordingly. But it also comes down to, in a way, figuring, figuring out of strategies to support those champions or these national coalitions more effectively. Because often, and I think that you can possibly speak about this from your own personal experience, that, you know, you those champions or those individuals often feel very isolated and they lack appropriate support mechanisms um, to continue driving those uh, efforts in respective countries. So I think that one um, important area here is to then figure out how to effectively support those individuals or those networks. But obviously Maybe there are, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just quickly add to, to Igor's comment by saying, Bernard, that I think there's an interesting thing that's happened just right now. Like we have the OER recommendation adoption in November of last year, and then we had COVID and the immediate shift to realizing the importance of online learning and the whole need to deliver learning in a different way. And, and this opportunity to kind of re-examine how education is delivered, I think, opens up a window of time where the, where the spark to generate interest could come to say, look, uh, we're not necessarily going to return to a, the previous normal, whatever we want to think of that as being, but instead we're going to move forward. And it's clear that um, education technology and online learning will, needs to be a kind of integral component of education moving forward. And open education is, a, is, is kind of part of that. And so I think that there's a a potential scenario here where the spark and the stimulation of interest can come by looking at the new way in which education will be offered moving forward from post-COVID. Yeah, I, I'll chime in quickly. I share that optimism. I, um, I just, I also want to point out there's a challenge right now to sort of seize that window of opportunity because of course governments are so busy and so overwhelmed and uh, it's difficult to in and make that that point in conversation. Although to be honest, we we're just at the beginning. So Paul talked about this network of open NGOs that have come together. We're just now starting to discuss those things, which is good. Uh, but ultimately what we're going to need are strategies and tactics to 
to take that message and put it into play with national governments. Um, what, what I wanted to share very briefly was just um, <clears throat> kind of time-tested tactics, uh, Werner, which I know you know about this, but um, the, the first question in my mind is what policy are we trying to get past? There are many, right? So we certainly one of the policies that we talk about are open licensing requirements on publicly funded education and research resources. Um, another policy that's happening or that's being discussed in many institutions right now are promotion and tenure policies. So when, when faculty or teachers go for uh, promotion uh, and if they're sharing their work as open educational resources or if they're publishing their research in open access journals, is that viewed as a positive or a negative in their promotion and tenure? That's a different type of policy. Uh, Paul was talking about you know different types of uh, uh, procurement. So how are we using existing funds to be more efficient and more effective in procuring educational resources, oftentimes at a primary and secondary level. That's a different type of policy. So I think that's the first question is, which one are we talking about? Um, th then what governments typically want to know is why? Like, why, why should I care about this? And um, what, what we see over and over is that if you can point out what the existing pain point is, or if you can point out what the existing problem is with how business is being done today, that this policy will improve or solve or make better, then you've got at least have their attention. Um, and then you have to move into what is the what are the, what are the benefits going to be for whom? So what are the benefits for government? What are the benefits for the states or the provinces? What are the benefits for the teachers, the students, the parents, et cetera? Um, I'll share one link here in the chat and then I'll also add it to the appropriate Google Doc. Uh, but uh, we, we wrote something with the Commonwealth of Learning a few years, which was really targeting national governments to try to make the general broad case for here's why uh, open policies are important in a national government when it comes to education. <laughs> oh, we fixed it all, didn't we, Werner? I want to pick up. I want to. I want to pick up what Cable said just uh, about um, about how we state the problem. I, I, I think I think we're far from really realizing the negative effects and the impact of the of the pandemic and how, especially for for K twelve. I'm I'm kind of scope there but it has a lot of relation with uh, national policies so or national governments so i think this no i think we need to state the problem uh, very clearly and see how oer or openness can really contribute to 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 the tremendous impact in in the educational sphere uh, i think we we haven't realized the the, the real impact and uh, i'm i'm thinking about uh you know, my country has huge problems of connectivity. So how, how does the flexibility of OER help, uh, you know, get the rural schools or, or underserved communities do, that do not have any type of connectivity um, in this transition, you know, to, to digital? If, if we are able to state that problem and, and see how openness can really contribute to that problem. Or um, I think another uh, issue is like, you know the coverage subject or curricular coverage of resources there's not enough resources so how does oer contribute to fill the gaps i think it's like the time to to do gap analysis of of the resources that our kids need or um or how to uptake the the issue of learning loss you know our children are losing learning prior learning so how does OER help them to recover that? Uh, uh, so that, that's what I was thinking about. How how can are we able to state the problems so we can get that interest from national governments to to really leverage and harness openness in OER to to, to help solve the problems? I think that's a great point. I was just going to jump in here because first. Werner, thank you for teeing up the, um, the topic number three, my topic, with uh, a little bit of a, a look at how we can incentivize some of, um, or we can we can address the, the need for um, policymakers really um, looking at some of the inclusive access measures like um, working offline and 
um, and, and so on. So I, I just want to make one quick note that um, I think some of us may not be as focused on policy in, in our day-to-day -day experiences here, and that's totally fine. We really welcome your input on our documents, whether you have existing resources like Lucy mentioned that relate to something that's more grassroots, that can still be really helpful in these documents for us. So um, I just, um, I'm realizing that we're, we're talking a lot about policy, which obviously makes sense for this, um, this presentation, but all of your ideas are really welcome and I think can help us in adapting language to those policymakers when we need to incentivize them or um, when we need to actually offer supports. And maybe I'll make one one final comment, Werner, around what the network of open orgs, this this network, this informal network of sister organizations is trying to do. One of the things we're we're doing right now is taking the OER recommendation and identifying actions government or institutions could take to implement each of the items in the recommendation, and then identifying how our respective organizations could help facilitate the adoption of those actions. What, one of the things that I think is missing, Werner, is that there's no, there's no sort of, if a government does want to get involved or wants to find out more, where do they go? We, we don't actually have a kind of single entry point for a government to go to, to even explore this issue or ask the questions that they might have. And so we're, I think this this effort of the network of open orgs is trying to ratchet up the kind of effort we've been all making in open education, which has often been targeted to the institution and the faculty and teachers within institutions and schools. To what is it that what could we do for government? And um, and when a government is ready, and I think you're right to say what might provoke or spark government interest then then we need to be able to s respond to that in some sensible way and and so we're trying to now work together as a whole group and not just rely on individual champions but as a group to say here's here's how uh, we could provide some support for those governments that want to explore or move in this direction it's a big task <laughs> and I'll just I'll just just add a plus one to that. Not only is it the right thing to do for these NGOs to all work together, but we've all acknowledged from the beginning. Frankly, it's the only way we're going to get this done. There are I think 193 UNESCO member states. If any one NGO on its own tried to take on the task of working with all of those countries, it's simply impossible. Not only that, but it would be substandard work because collectively as this group of NGOs and other open advocates and organizations around the world, we are going to come up with a better set of answers, a better set of artifacts, a better set of advice. And frankly, it's going to take all of us uh, to be engaged in this activity. So, you know, Werner, you've asked some really excellent questions. I would guess if, if we looked across these 193 member states, probably you know, 70, 80% of them have exactly the same questions that you just asked. And so there's no sense in working in silos on this. This is a collective need. We have this collective opportunity because it's a UNESCO. It's an, this is coming out of an IGO. This is an international instrument that is focused globally. And if we work together, we can, we can make a lot of progress on this. Are there, so thank you. Igor continues to remind us to add resources to the documents, which was our, <laughs> items. Thanks, Igor, for doing that. Um, if, if, I, if, I, if I may interject, uh, Cable, though, because what, what seems to be coming out of this conversation here is that people are articulating needs, specific needs. Um, and I think that that's really even more important than, yeah. well, the sharing of links to resources and projects and initiatives is important, but articulating those needs is equally, if, if not more important. So even like with you, Werner, and others, uh, because I've been monitoring some of the exchanges in chat, uh, please make sure that you articulate those directly in those Google documents, because that's going to help us to, to figure out the next steps. And, and Hans actually is a representative of the government, so it would be actually useful to hear his viewpoints on this also. 
Hans, if you are willing to get on the stage, you're welcome to do so. Yeah, we love having people <laughs> up on the stage. Uh, if you see so you know how up in the upper right, I'm not leaving. <laughs> upper right corner of your screen is a uh, a red button that says something audio and video. If you click on that, we will invite you up. Come on up, Come on Hans. Up, Hans. <laughs> the price is right. Okay, I invited up Hans. He's on his way. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Hans. Nice to see you. Hello over there. Now I just shared what we've been doing in Flanders, Belgium, into the notes. <laughs> Do you want to? highlight some of those things, Hans? Yeah, well, um, maybe, maybe some people know, but we have a, a really popular platform in Flanders for K-12, where teachers share their resources uh, openly in the Creative Commons license, of course. Um, and due to COVID, we saw a lot of other organizations also publicly funded, uh, starting with uh, platforms like us, uh, telling teachers that this was the time to start sharing. Uh, which raised questions even into the political political world in Belgium. Uh, so we were invited in, into the parliament to explain what we were doing. And, and a lot of politicians were um, yeah, uh, promoting our work and asking other organizations to uh, start working together with, with us to have only one plat platform for OER, which is really good. But on the other hand, we saw the, that the Minister of Education also funded companies um, to, uh, yeah, to create extra content because of COVID. There was a lot of extra need for content in business education, like videos and, and uh, video platforms and so on. Um, but yeah, they, they were given extra money from the government, but without the requirement to make it openly available. And that, for me, is, again, yeah, something we miss that's the, the the policy or just having some people thinking if we if we fund something publicly the public money it should be publicly available and um, so we also here we still have a lot of work to do yeah. well, Han, thanks for sharing you know in the spirit of action if you find that you need any assistance with the government or in writing language to ensure that the publicly funded resources are openly licensed. Uh, it's work that many of us do and we're more than happy to help you. So if that's of use, uh, let us know. Yeah. yeah, that would be helpful indeed. So if you if you can share some resources or, uh, it's, it's also because yeah, we're so involved in the work we are doing that uh, a week like this is really interesting. Then suddenly the focus is again on Creative Commons and openly and open resources. But next week we'll be doing our normal job again, and then we forget about it. Yeah, it's it's about the focus on openness. <laughs> um, so yeah, helping there to to uh, give us some extra resources or documents that we can share into the political world here to the, yeah. To help the policymakers, it would be great. Does anybody else have uh, questions or feedback for Hans? I, I we had another uh, question we wanted to get to in the chat. Yeah, well, somebody's just asking for Hans to provide links to those platforms that he mentioned. So, Hans, perhaps you could do that in the chat directly. I'll do so. <laughs> <laughs> and I think somebody was asking. Um, uh, perhaps this is addressed to you, Paul, uh, about the link to the to the network of organizations. Yeah, I was just about to reply to Lucy, so but maybe I'll just comment. Lucy, yeah, thank you for your question about how to, like, where is the website for the network of open orgs? I'll just say we don't actually have one yet, um, but I'm pleased to hear that there's an interest in, in that. Um, it's really just been a kind of um, informal, not informal, but, but a kind of um, 
initial attempt to form a collaboration across a whole bunch of organizations. If you know of other organizations that you think would be interested in participating, um, we welcome that and you can just add it to any of the Google Docs we've been using here as part of this session or you can send me an email and I'll just put my email address in. Um, but I think uh, given your question, perhaps we should have a website um, and share out some of the work that we've been doing. Um, Agenda item for our next meeting. Yes. <laughs> Jenrin, you uh, saw somebody's note in chat. Who was that? And could you flag that for us? There's lots of good questions and yeah, comments. I think there have been so many great questions. I think um, I had noted Lucy's question earlier. Um, to another example from the state of California of um, stepping up OER efforts. Um, and then let's see, I think that might be it right now. A, a lot of really great discussion points have been coming up. I think a lot of the questions point, point to the need and I would say it's a need to somehow foster collaboration between initiatives. So take what Hans is doing, really fantastic stuff. And in, in my view, like has enormous potential outside of Belgium to be adopted as an approach to how to do K-12 open education. But what's the mechanism for that kind of knowledge sharing and transfer of capability from one organization to another? And I think that still remains a challenge in our space, and that is how do we bring organizations together for collaboration and not just for learning from each other like we are now, but for actual kind of adoption of best practices and methods for doing things. Um, I, 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 yeah, I still see that as a significant challenge. I think to some extent we, with the network of open orgs are starting to embark down a path that could lead to that being a, a, an aspect of work that we do. But currently our, our work is really focused on the UNESCO OER recommendation. And so um, that kind of collaboration, if, if it facilitates the recommendation, then I think that's really part of what we should be doing. Paul made a really important point when he was talking about sustainability. Uh, talking about governments using existing resources and funding, but more effectively than they currently do. I think that that same principle goes for all of us, right? If we are, if we are working individually, if we are working in silos, if we're working in ways where we're not sharing information and solutions with each other, then we are not working in an optimal way. And so, for example, I'm gonna share, just promote a session at the summit tomorrow so tomorrow, the CC Open Education Platform is going to be meeting. So this is a this is a group of like 1,100 people from about 80 countries all around the world, and they they're focused on working on implementing uh, open education in their countries. And we come together and we try to figure out what we can do together. We are going to start planning our work for 2021, and we're going to start talking about it tomorrow. We're going to meet again in mid December and come up with what our plan is. I'm very hopeful that this conversation will play into that conversation. So they all, all of those people who are members of that particular group know about the UNESCO recommendation. And wouldn't it be nice if, if that group was you know, part and parcel of this conversation, working on uh, creating artifacts, working on uh, making connections with governments, and that the other NGOs also have you know, various of networks of people. And of course, there's a lot of overlap between these networks where people wear multiple hats. I'm a Wikimedian, I'm a Mozillian, I'm a member of OE Global, I'm in the Creative Commons Network, I'm part of Spark, you know, the, people work in various areas of open. And so, you know, part of what, you know, as Paul's talking about the network of NGOs, that we're really, really trying to be thoughtful about is how can we focus so much goodwill and so much so much time and resource that that members of the open ed community and orgs in the open ed community where we can really focus on this opportunity uh, over the coming years because this is a big deal just i know we've got a really short amount of time but we i 
like two other questions that related to the kind of ed tech platforms. So um, one was just noting that there is currently a new uh, sort of new scramble um, going on with um, traditional ed tech platforms um, that OER advocates should be aware of. And the, the second one was that was Yasin's question, how might ed tech developers or entrepreneurs best contribute to openness and OER? So kind of uh, two different sides of the same coin maybe. And are there any supports that might mitigate working in isolation on OER tools? Throwing a big question out there with <laughs> This is an interesting question I've seen. So I'll just say, like Cable has said, um, there are other sessions at the CC Summit coming up that um, partly address this question. Um, one session that I'll be doing later on on Thursday is exploring the social framework for open education and what that might look like. And part of that will explore what is the role of the private sector or entrepreneurs in open education? What is the role of government? And what is the role of, let's call us commoners, you know, the, the people who are not part of a publicly funded state initiative or a market-based commercial enterprise. And how do you think about creating a hybrid open education environment that that is a blend of those three entities? This actually pertains as well, of course, to the sustainability question of the OER recommendation and, and um, is I think an area of work that we still have some tensions within. I think there's some tensions between the open education community and those in the private sector that need to be resolved. So um, one, quite, one suggestion I might say is that if your ed tech development efforts are, um, are also open source, then you might participate in Open Ed Tech Global, which is an initiative that's looking to bring together ed tech developers that are practicing openness in their development efforts to begin to build out a more complete ed tech open infrastructure. <laughs> so that's another another thing. One, one last comment for me, and I know we only have a few more minutes, but I just want to make one more comment about this really pertains to quite a few different people's questions, and in particular, maybe Werner's concern about what will spark government interest. What I think one of the things that would spark a lot of government interest is if there was one government somewhere in the world that went all in on open education and showed how it can make a huge difference to their people. And if there was an example, exemplary government like that, then I think it wouldn't then rely on all of us individual champions to be making the points about the benefits for open education but there'd be at least one example that we can say here's a government here's a country here's a unesco member state that adopted the oer recommendation and look at the difference it's made for them and so i'm really hoping at as the as we kind of migrate past the critical issues that are governments are all grappling with that one of them, at least one government, will really um, glom on to open education as a key part of its forward strategy. And we can use it as an example. Igor, we've only got a couple of minutes. Do you want to tell folks what we're doing next with, uh, with your good work? <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah, so I, was just, I was just actually typing that uh, into the chat window. I'm just trying to get to our session. Anyway, so um, just briefly, uh, this session will also uh, take place again in November during Open Education Conference. So that's the second week of November. And also during Open Education Global 2020 Conference, which is the week after. And I'm going to pop in the link there to our session afterwards. Um, we might modify the approach slightly uh, we will assess how this session went today so if you have any specific um, recommendations on how we could improve or change this session make it maybe even more effective please use the um, the agenda document and, and pop your suggestions directly there but also i think that we are going to keep these documents open throughout the week so if you have any additional inputs throughout the week uh, in relation to any of those topics or just in general uh, please uh, feel free to do so throughout the week Thanks, Igor. And with that, we are exactly.
exactly at the hour. So thank you, everybody. We had a great group today. Uh, as Igor said, the docs are still open. If you've got ideas later, please add them. Uh, all these recordings will be shared out. And we thank you and have a wonderful Creative Commons Summit. We'll see you in other sessions. Thanks, all. Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye.